Welcome to VUC 2019, Visions Under Construction. All right, our special guest today, David Duffett, has indeed confirmed that he is going to be with us at Kamaio World, which is May 6th to 8th, 2019. Well, this is 2019, so that'd be silly if it was if I was announcing for either 2018 or 2020. But the point is, it's in a few days, really, a couple of weeks. David will be there, and here's Mr. Dovett in a photo we captured in the wild. How about that? <laughs> That's Ruth, and I don't know the gentleman there, but this is what <laughs> David looks like. <laughs> yeah, that's a guy called Ross from let, Scotland. Let's see if David has changed. Hello, David, and thanks for joining us. Hi there, Randy. How are you doing? It is absolutely fantastic to have you. Let me switch over to my camera if I can find it. There we go. Uh, and by the way, my website, if you want to hear my music, because why not plug that while we're at it? Saxaholic.me, downloadable free ringtones and some of my stuff I'm working on because I'm learning how to play other instruments. And that'll be the end of that for now. We have Mr. Corrado Mella with us. Hello, Corrado. Thanks for Okay. Me. Hello. Thank you. And sorry for being late. Engrossed in many you things. Will, you will be fine. We have Jay Carpenter with us. Hey, Jay. Good, Hello. Good to have you from Phoenix, Arizona. Thank of course, you. the Honorable Mr. Michael Graves. Hey, who? Honor? What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me switch this over so that we get rid of the um, gratuitous uh, self-promo. All right. We're over to the direct camera. That way there'll be less lag. David, you have zero experience in presenting, right? Because you've only done this for like 15 years or 20. So we're going to talk a little bit about what you're doing as far as setting down your skills. For those of you who haven't had the privilege of seeing David, by the way, he is the guy. He's that guy. He's the guy who throws out the chocolates and the various treats. And I'd love to know the secret of which treats you select. But before we do, let's go through a little bit of... Uh, your history, David, because it's been so many years since we've had the privilege of having you here. Um, how did you get started in all this? Tell us a little about Telespeak and your your uh, work as community manager, which you were exemplary at, and anything else you want to talk about? Sure. Okay. I'm just noticing, by the way, I was using natural lighting and the sun has just come out. So it's going to give me a, a very shiny forehead for a while. Um, but not not to worry. If you can live with it, I can live with it. Um, so I, I started um, doing presentations way, way back uh, just before uh, the turn of the millennium back in those days. So I've been at it for well over 20 years. And one of the, in fact, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bring the blind down a little bit. Otherwise, I'm going to be irradiated here. Excuse me for a moment. <laughs> what David doesn't know is that we have a secret camera behind. No, go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, I was working for a telecoms company called Aculab, A-C-U-L-A-B. They were doing um, uh, T1E1 cards and DSP cards. And I was asked to go over to America to do a presentation. Um, it was a TMC event, but it was way before they called it IT Expo. They used to call it ComSol Expo, Communications Solutions Expo. And this one was in Washington, D.C., and Al Gore was the keynoter. So that gives you an idea as to how long ago it was. Right. And um, I did the presentation over there, and it went uh, relatively well. But what I noticed was a lot of the other people doing presentations, although they were technically very clever, probably, um, probably <laughs> uh, much cleverer than me, their ability to deliver presentations wasn't quite as good. And so, um, you know, I, I began to acquire a good reputation for presentations, not because I was, um, you know, miles and miles better. But as you know, in order to win a race, you only have to be just a little bit ahead of the other folk. And um, I, I put the work into my presentations to make sure that they stood out a little bit. And so that's how I began to build my career. I was just... Uh... I was just tweeting to Alison Smith to ask her to come by and say hi. So oh, that would be nice. It'd be lovely I, to see Alison. I thought it would. David, you're going to be at Kamaio World. You're going to be at um, Com. There's lots of cons going on. <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's ComCon, of course. Um, in fact, let's let's handle them in date order, Randy. Right next week, we've got Open Sips Summit over in Amsterdam. Uh, that's Bogdan and the crew there with Open Sips. Um, and then the following week, there is uh, Camellio World with Daniel and everybody over there. Looking forward to that one as well. Um, I'm speaking at Open Sip Summit along these lines about why nerds aren't heard. 
seven reasons or seven ways that geeks sabotage their own presentations and what to do about it. Um, then at Camellio World, I'm taking uh, a breather and just uh, attending there and just looking forward to hanging out with all the fine people that go along to that event. And then ComCon is coming in early July. And uh, I don't know whether you've heard, but I'm actually helping out at ComCon uh, in a kind of domestic way. Last year, Dan had the lovely Kathleen. Uh, you'll know Kathleen King from the Free Switch Project and, and other places. And I happened to know that she wasn't available this time around. So I volunteered to Dan and said, look, Dan, if there's anything I can do to help, I, I know you haven't got access to Kathleen like you did last year. Um, I'd be happy to do that. And so uh, Dan's taken me up on that. And so I will be doing a, a bit of domestic helping as well as speaking at ComCon as well. And then, of course, the following month, there is ClueCon in uh, Chicago and uh, Tony and co are having me over to speak there. So I'm very, very much looking forward to that one as well. Okay. Somebody <laughs> says that they're only seeing me and I don't get that because I had you set up. So let me switch the, switch the focus around a little bit. That would be horrible if people are just looking at me. So we're going to put uh, Corrado on. Corrado, say something. Say hello. Yeah. Hello. I'm here. Uh, let me see if we are and going live. In my, Corrado's in my – this might be some hangout weirdness. And, uh, gosh, I'm really sorry if people are having to look at me while David's speaking. I had him um, outlined as I have Corrado now. I'm going to switch over to Jay Carpenter. Jay, you can go ahead and say hello. hello. Yeah, I could see David just fine when he was talking. Well, that's how uh, in the hangout, though. And I'm going to switch over to Michael. And, of course, Michael knows what's going on. And here he is. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm not seeing any change. We're just seeing you in all the live stuff. So yeah. Yeah. I think the hangout is taking the feed directly from something you are feeding, Randy. Instead Have of you done this deliberately, hangout. Randy? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely not. No, well, not only that, but, I mean, I have the focus – for example, right now the focus is on Michael. You should be seeing him. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? I know I did. There's a bit of, there's a bit of delay, but. Oh, this should be right. This should be right. It should be Michael now. Now it should be me. And uh, it should be following the person who is speaking. Shall I try speaking? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, to me, you're good, but I don't know what's mm, going on. No, not on the, on the live. Not on the live. I'm sorry. Uh, let's hope that the <laughs> But the audio will be fine no matter what. So let's yeah, go ahead. True. And, yeah. And also, let's hope that the video, if the video, uh, uh, the archive video on YouTube isn't good, I don't know what we'll do. But I, I think I know what happened, Randy. You saw the background of my video feed, which is, is my office, which has only just been moved from one location to another. And you thought, that looks so bad. I'm not going to allow that video feed through. That's absolutely not true. But anyway. Uh, well, this is extremely distracting, but like Michael says, uh, hopefully the, if the audio is recorded properly, we will have the audio and that's good. Uh, we all got faces for radio. So there you go. This is <laughs> what, what, what I can do if you'd like, Randy, is just uh, continue with that little brief history. Yeah, I was talking you. about doing the presentation over in Comsol Expo back uh, in the year 2000. Right. Um, but I could just explain how I came to get the gig with, uh, Digium and uh, how, how that all came to be. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Okay. So um, what happened was I, I, I got this reputation for doing very reasonable presentations, and as such, I spent more time in the U.S. than I previously had done, coming over to speak at various things like um, Vaughn and uh, uh, I, I, they called it VoIP developer for a while, did TMC, and also uh, then it turned into IT Expo. And back in 2004 or thereabouts, I saw Digium with a booth uh, and uh, they had asterisk there. And I, I didn't really know what it was, but I began to look at it and I got quite excited about it. And, and so I formed my own business in 2006, really around asterisk. Um, asterisk consulting and training was what I was doing. And I, 2006 was the first year I participated in um, Astricon. It had been going since 2004, so I came kind of two years late to the party, but I participated in every single Astricon since uh, 2006. And I began to bring things along to it, not just uh, the, a talk here and there, but uh, features to it, like you may remember Fastest Dude to the Dial Tone, like a little contest for yep. um, ast asterisk people to come and flex their muscles and win prizes. Uh, and so I, I really enjoyed that because I love the asterisk 
uh, technology and I love the Asterisk community as well. And so that, that led in 2012 to Digium asking me to come and be the worldwide community director for the Asterisk project. And uh, so I've been, been doing it since then, really enjoyed doing that. Um, one of the downsides of doing it was that I didn't actually get to make a normal, regular Astricon talk. Although I got to kind of MC the whole show and to um, editorially be responsible for the content of Astricon, it, it stopped me from actually doing my own talk, if you like. So for the last uh, seven odd years, I've not been able to do a talk. And things have changed because uh, I no longer am working as the worldwide community director for Sangoma Stroke Digium now. In fact, I don't believe they have one. I think I think Jim Mackey, the um, VP of marketing, is kind of fulfilling uh, the role of getting stuff out there to the public. And so um, this year, I'm thinking that I might get to submit a talk to Astrocon. That's extremely cool and would be a big change. Yeah, in, indeed. Uh, uh, maybe they, they would like to hear about geeks speaking. I think we want to hear about geeks speaking. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, let, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about that. So over the years of doing that, so 20 plus years have been involved in technical, mainly telecoms conferences. Um, I've, I've been delivering those presentations. I've been recruiting presenters. And I've also been um, uh, observing the, the fact, fact that not every technical presenter is as good as I think they could be. I mean, can, can I get an amen there? Has, have you ever seen a presentation amen. that, amen. that really wasn't that good? Yes. Michael was talking about one, which we won't name. Yeah, no, we're not going to name names. But, but let's just say everybody who stands on a stage who isn't Steve Jobs could do better. Right. Yeah. There you go. And, and, and so we, you know, we, and we know that these people that we see at conferences like a ClueCon, like an Astrocon, we know that technically they know exactly what they're talking about but maybe they're not connecting with their audience as well as they should. And I think that at a technical conference, somehow it isn't quite so bad because most of the audience are technical people. And so if you like, there's a rapport already there. There's a credibility already there. And so the technical audience will take what the technical person is saying um, and they'll, they'll, they'll kind of overlook certain aspects or issues with the presentation. Of course, the same is definitely not true when that person is out in the big wide world talking to non-technical people. And let's face it, the decision makers out there are not always technical people. The people that are going to give you a job, the people that are going to give you funding for your company, the people that uh, might be present in the presentation you make, some of the more important ones might not be that technical. And so you can't rely on your technical credibility to give you a, a kind of a leg up in doing that presentation. David, do you touch on the issue of language, native native tongue? In other words, we've all probably experienced this. You know, when we go to Camellia World, which is a great, great place to learn about a lot of things that are happening, but there are many people from a lot of different countries, and a large number of these presenters do not have English as their first language. Some are good at it and others are kind of monotone or whatever. Are you getting into that issue? Because it's a problem for people to, yeah, if you're going to present in a language that's not your own, hey, you know, I think most of us are pretty tolerant because you realize, especially, I have to say, coming if you're English or American, you probably speak zero languages other than your own anyway. So you're probably tolerant. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, um, it's not something that's really covered in the book. I mean, I very much admire people that do deliver presentations in a language other than their first, because I think it takes uh, some bravery to get out there and do that and some confidence. Um, and whether you are working outside of your language to um, an audience that's not got any interpreter present or you have, there is going to be an impact because even when they've got simultaneous translation, I've spoken at several conferences where there has been simultaneous um, translation. One of those would be Voip Today in Spain. Another one would be the Asterisk Lounge in Japan when I presented in English. But of course, uh, uh, the the 99% of the audience were Japanese. It it just affects the presentation, doesn't it? You can't get the same level of humour and you can't get the same level of... um, kind of spontaneity because these things uh, uh, detract from it. And so, no, the answer is, Randy, I don't cover that in the book. This is really about the, mainly about the nonverbal skills actually around presentations. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So yeah, there's there's so much to know about these things, and there's such a variable uh, quality in people's presentations. And um, in passing, so that I'm not sounding like I'm shining only your shoes, David, because you're a great presenter. You know who's a fantastic presenter, and hopefully we'll we'll see him uh, in Berlin shortly. It's Ule. And that and English is not his first language, uh, but Ule speaks good. Well, in Sweden, they generally do speak good Eng good English. Yeah. I speak a good English anyway. <laughs> Ule is great, and his presentations are great. And I just want to mention in passing that one of the things he told me he takes his vacation photos and put, and puts them into his presentations. He finds a way to place them, and it's true that they're more interesting than the than the effing slides that a lot of people use. Go ahead. Yes, in fact, that, yeah, I, I've, I've been uh, privileged to see a good few Ulay presentations over the years, and I can attest to his uh, acumen there. Um, I've, I've used a similar trick many years ago. In fact, before I got into presenting uh, at conferences, I used to run technical training for the Civil Aviation Authority, a bit like the American Federal Aviation Authority. I would teach air traffic engineers how to repair the systems at airports and air traffic control centres, and these could be very long and um, if you were not careful, slightly dull classes about the return audio path on a given uh, <laughs> transmission line. And uh, I used to have some slides. In fact, one of them was of my father meeting the Queen Mother when he was a schoolboy. And I would just randomly drop these into the presentation just to spice things up <laughs> a bit and, and change the direction every now and again. Um, but I, I, I don't really agree with the thing that you hear people say about, you know, well, it's a dry subject or a boring subject. I, I think it's really in the hands of the presenter to uh, make any subject they're dealing with. If it's worth presenting, it's worth working on it to make it interesting, interactive and exciting as far as I'm concerned. So what are the uh, I'm a little, <laughs> just a little distracted by the fact that I can't seem to get the focus on you, but um, the audio won't matter. What are the challenges of, the, in other words, you're talking about the the gestural language, the, the, the language of being in front of people, because you could sit in front of a microphone, which is what I'm doing right now with a slide representing me, and there's there's no real communication there. When you're in a room with people, you need to walk around. I'm think, trying to think of picture you and picture Ole, and you guys kind of walk around a little bit. And you have a language that works, and you're Ill, you're at ease. So I think that's part of it. But yeah, I, I think that's a, ma a massive part is for the presenter to be at ease because I'm sure you've seen presentations where you can feel that the presenter is not at ease. They may be a little bit awkward or a little bit nervous, and that has a habit of transmitting into the audience. So uncomfortable presenter makes an uncomfortable audience. And what I would say is I'll I'll come on to the seven protocols that I've boiled things down to um, in a moment. But I would say the most important thing that a presenter of any kind, uh, whether technical or not, can do is to establish a rapport with their audience, to invest the time at the beginning of the presentation to create the communications channel. And there's lots of different ways of establishing rapport. Um, uh, delicate humour uh, is a good way. Um, Talking about shared experiences is another thing. Um, understanding that you're all on the same side. All of those things are going to go to make for a rapport with the audience. And the wider you make the rapport with the audience, the wider your communications channel is. In other words, if we were thinking about this as a broadband connection, if you're not careful, you can try and start your presentation with an, with an old ADSL or an analog connection that's working at, you know, 100K. Whereas if you want to get it up to, you know, fiber optic levels of 250 meg, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, both ways. Um, symmetrical. Not, symmet that's the one. If you want to make it 250 meg symmetrical, then you need to invest the time at the beginning of the presentation to make that so that not only will the audience receive your information um, better, but just as importantly, you will read your audience well as well. Hey, and we're typing... <laughs> We're uh, voraciously uh, typing away, trying to figure out why this isn't working. Anyway, very distracting. I'll, I, if I have to go through and edit all this and uh, remove all these extraneous so your comments. Seven, your seven protocols, David. I, I read the paper. The paper is good. I recommend the paper. The paper is a great uh, lead into the book. But Thank you. You set seven protocols. Let's, let's walk them down. Yes. Okay. So the, the, the seven protocols 
um, would be the first, they all begin with P handily, just like the word protocol. And the first one would be the purpose of the presentation. I, I think all too often when people are asked to do a presentation, what they'll do is they'll whip open their keynote on their Mac or their PowerPoint on their Microsoft uh, thing, and they'll just start hacking on slides because they think that is the presentation. Um, and they would be well advised to actually think and spend some time about the uh, concentrating on the purpose. What is the purpose of this presentation in overview terms? In other words, if I was to describe this presentation with a general aim and maybe some very specific objectives that I want the audience to achieve by the end of it, what would they be? And and I would list those down in as something I call, sounds a little bit fanatical, but I tend to call it a learning contract. So I might have a single sheet of paper or a, a single document that tells me the overall aim of the presentation and the specific objectives that I'm looking to achieve. And I would use that learning contract to tie in the person that asked me to do that presentation in the first place, who I call the sponsor, and the audience for the presentation as well. Sometimes you can't talk to the audience ahead of the presentation or even a representative from them. And so the way to tie them in at the beginning would to say would be to say, look, here's a list of the things that I think we need to achieve across this session. Do you agree? You know, or is there something you think is missing from this? Or is there something you would uh, you would say is not relevant to us? Because if it's not relevant, it's hardly worth covering. So I, I want to tie the audience, the sponsor, and myself as the presenter into a kind of a contract that we can review at the end of the presentation just to make sure we're all happy. You know, somebody once told me that it was, you got to tell them what you're going to tell them, then you got to tell them, then you got to tell them what you told them. Okay, so yeah, so now we're moving on to the kind of structure of the presentation, if you like, and that is the next P. The next P is the planning of the presentation, where you would put that structure in place. Yes, some some more cynical people might, call, might say, you've got to tell them how you're going to bore them, bore them, and then tell them how you, tell them how you bore them. <laughs> but, but, hang on i think i was in that session <laughs> but I, I do agree but it's good to have a structure and actually what it hits on there is people's attention spans because as you know as human beings we all have attention spans and we're all programmed somehow to remember the beginnings and endings of things and more than we remember the middle in fact the, the you know the, the posh names or the, the scientific name for this is primacy and recency our memories are pretty good at holding first and last. And let me give you an example. If you think about any particular job you've had, you probably remember the first day or two on that job and the last day or two on that job, but you probably don't remember every day in between. Do you see what I mean? Oh, yeah. 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 And these things make us so much worse in terms of we, we all have ADD now and, and we're all sort of social butterflies attention wise. Indeed. So, yes, we, we, we tend to have shorter attention spans because we're used to getting instant gratification. So one of the tricks that we can use in a presentation is actually to break up. So if you said to me, you've got a 40 minute presentation, David, I might plan actually to break that up into three parts or it maybe even four parts to make them mini presentations within the presentation. So I get more of your firsts and more of your lasts. Because if I've got, let's say, 30 minutes, if I did it as one big 30 minute chunk, that would give me the first couple of minutes and the last couple of minutes. But if I broke it down into three sub uh, structures, I could get three lots of firsts and lasts. So yeah, planning the presentation and putting a structure in place that's going to work in with your audience's memories and the way that they recognize information is key. But it's it's not just the beginnings and endings, uh, the first and the last, the primary and the recency. It's also planning to tell them things in a way that they're going to already recognize. And I'll give you an example of that. And it, 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 of course, it is the analogy. Using an analogy to tell somebody some new information along the lines of existing information they already know. Let me give you an example. This will take you back to your college days when we think about Ohm's law and uh, resistance in electrical circuits. Now, if I was introducing that uh, to somebody uh, in a brand new, uh, who's, who's not come across it before, what I might say is imagine a hose pipe in your garden and water flowing through it. And when I put my foot on the hose pipe and squash it, or if you're in America, squish it, then that restricts the flow of the water. And thus I'm using something that everybody can relate to in order to introduce a new concept. So that, that's another um, 
thing to get things into people's memories is links with what they already know or analogies. Repetition is also a good thing. So if you can repeat the main points that you want to give across a presentation, not only at the beginning and at the end, but in the middle as well, that's going to be good. Repetition is, after all, the mother of learning, but it's also the distant cousin of boredom. So you have to be a little bit careful with the way you pepper some repetition throughout the presentation. And then last is outstanding things. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this. If perish the thought, Michael, uh, and, and, and other members of the panel here, I was wanting to show you all of my holiday photos from my road trip last year in uh, the US, where I went from Key West in Florida to Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, I've probably got about 5,000 photos from that trip. And as I went through them, you'd probably remember the first ones. You'd probably remember the last ones. You'd probably remember any repeated slides or pictures that there were. But you would also remember slides or pictures of the places you'd already been, the links to what you already knew, and the outstanding ones. So if most of them were landscape scenes, but a couple of them were of a dog riding a bike, then you would probably remember that dog riding a bike because it had been outstanding amongst the rest. And so that's another key to getting things into people's memories during a presentation is to make something outstanding or exciting. Of course, there's a, there's, a, there's a trick that some comedians use is to refer back to something they said before for comedy effect. And you can use uh, comedy or comedic effect uh, to ingrain some concepts in, in people. Just going back to something you said before for uh, uh, referring that twice, as you said, but also uh, repeating something that was uh, not funny before in a funny mode, in a funny way the, the, the following moment. Uh, so that's, that triggers that uh, amygdala moment in your brain because you, you get uh, some sort of reward off of that. Uh, it makes you feel happy, so you have that positive feeling and you remember the thing more, more likely uh, in, in, in long term. Yes, very much so. In fact, that specific thing of, of mentioning something early on in a presentation and then coming back to it later, especially near the end, is sometimes called a collapsed loop uh, technique, where you bring something in and then you come back to it right at the end to make a point. I can give you an example I used once. I was applying for a job as a training manager for yet another telecoms company. This one was called Ionica, and it was doing um, wireless local loop technology in the UK. And I started off by asking, and, and the context of this presentation was, I was just making the presentation to a handful of people that were selection panel for the job. And so this was a kind of get the job presentation, if you like, that they were putting each candidate through. And I started off by asking them how much money they thought was spent in the UK on training each year. And I'd researched it and got the figure. So I had them make a guess. And, and I forget the Exa uh, the exact figure, but let, let's just say it was £38 billion a year that was actually spent on training. So I got them guessing and I revealed that figure to them at the beginning of the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I said, look, you know, I told you at the beginning um, that £38 billion a year was spent on training in the UK. Uh, that means while I've been speaking just for these last 15 minutes, the UK has spent, you know, £12.9 million on training. And I think we could probably all agree that not all of that would have been well spent some of it would have been wasted. And let me just end this presentation by saying, if you make me your training manager, your share of that money will be 100% effectively used. Thank you very much. So <laughs> I'll kind of, you know, put the beginning and the end together, if you like. Did you get the gig? I did get the job in that particular case. Yeah, it's probably the, 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 the job that I've wanted most when I've been through the interview process. And I was I was really scared that I wasn't going to get it, but, but actually I did. And so I was very blessed and grateful for that. So um, that brings us on to the third uh, protocol, and that is preparation. So you might have thought, well, if I was thinking about the purpose of a presentation and I was planning the presentation, surely that counts for preparation. Yes, it does. But there's lots of other things that you have to think about when preparing a presentation. One of them is your own learning style versus the learning style of your audience. And when I say learning style, what, well, some people have really gone to town and studied this very, very deeply. Um, uh, some people called Honey and Mumford did a huge amount of research into learning styles and came up with um, uh, ways of uh, defining people by their learning styles. Um, I tend to simplify things and just think about whether you're an action-orientated person an input-orientated person or more of a reflective person. 
And uh, again, I'll give you a quick example. Imagine if you've got a brand new um, electrical appliance at home. Let, let's say it's a, a digital video recorder, a, a hard disk or a solid state video recorder or streaming device. If you're an action person, you'd probably rip the thing out of the box, plug it straight in. You wouldn't be looking at the instructions at all. You'd be connecting everything up and then fiddling with it until you understood how it worked. That's somebody who is action orientated. Now, somebody else may get that same thing out and they, they may read the manual from cover to cover before they even get the thing out of the cellophane. Um, and they would be more in, input orientated. And there's nothing wrong with either of those approaches. They're just different. But can you imagine that if you're setting up a presentation and you're one sort of person and you set your presentation up in that way and it turns out your audience are the opposite, they're not going to have the best experience. Can, can you imagine that? Mm. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so thinking about the different types of people in your audience um, is part of the preparation. Um, thinking about the way you're going to introduce certain content concepts, whether you're using analogies, things like that, is also part of the preparation. But more than that, what about the room you're going to do the presentation in? If you're going to use a projector for a PowerPoint presentation, you know, can the room be blacked out? Mm. Um, what happens if there's a power cut? Have you got some kind of backup? Um, you know, I, I remember seeing a quite an interesting presentation from Intel once on um, Ethernet, and they were going through CSMA CD, Carrier Sense Multiple Access and Collision Detect Technology. This is some time ago. And somebody put up their hand and asked a quick question. And uh, the guy, in order to answer it, he stopped the presentation and he did a quick thing on a flip chart. And I would say that the thing he did on the flip chart, the explanation he gave as he drew it out on the flip chart, was just about 100 times more effective than any of the slides he'd got in his presentation. So when you're putting together a presentation, you need to think about things like that because that's outstanding. That's something different that people are going to remember. And so that should also be part of your preparation. Uh, I guess probably the guy was more uh, apt at doing on the fly on the hoof stuff rather than prepared stuff. So probably drawing on the flip chart and then going solo and going free, uh, it was probably his best rather than, yeah. than yeah. yeah. So indeed. you need to research that too. The preparation is also finding your style. The one is more effective. But very much so, very much so. Be being true to your own personal style is an absolute key because if you try to get away from your own style, let, let's say you see somebody do a really funny joke and you think, I'm going to build that in my presentation. If it doesn't work for your style, it's going to fall flat and it's going to make people even more more uncomfortable. So you definitely have to be true to your own style. And, and again, yes, you're quite right. Part of your preparation would be making sure that everything uh, fits with your own style. David, but, yes, if, I, if, I, if I can just react to something I, I you just said, I've, I've had to run around a little bit, so I hope I've understood properly this. But... Um, you seem to be saying what we've always said for websites. When we talk to people who want to design their websites, I've always told them, look, there's a simple way to do this. Put yourself in the position of the person who is going to come to that site and why are they coming there and what do they need to do? Um, and I think what you just said uh, earlier, not the last thing, but just a little bit earlier, was to try to put yourself, sit yourself in the audience as if you were watching yourself and look at what exactly you're saying and how you're saying it and whether that's going to go over to the majority of people who are sitting there. So getting back to the website for a second, and I'll shoot it back to you. Mostly, God, and I had this experience today and every day you go to a website and it's like, you're looking for a certain thing and they have, it's obvious that they have not reflected on the purpose of the website for some reason, the page you're there, and they're showing you what they want to show you, and it isn't actually what you came for. And you always have to consider all of the roles. So I'm going to, getting back to you for a second, but always considering the roles of the people who are seated in that room. Who are these people? Are they deciders? Are they the people who are going to be speaking to the deciders? And what are they expecting to hear from you? And how is this going to help them? Am I, am I on the frequency at all? You're bang on the money, Randall. Yeah, I mean, it, there's several different dimensions to that. Um, remembering first that your audience, when they come to a presentation, they're all tuned into that one radio station, WIIFM, what's in it for me, obviously, you know, because we, we all are. We, we want to know what we're going to get from this presentation. But 
what you've just said is is true in the dimension of content and and actually just to sort of uh, uh, do something parenthetical a minute one of the things that geeks do is they think that the technical content they're conveying is the be all and end all of the presentation and very often the audience is probably not as technical as them and they don't need that level of technical information um, and frankly, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about them. And the way you demonstrate how much you care about them is by tailoring your content to that level. So, yes, to agree with you, Randy, the, the content has got to be tailored to the audience. But also the other point I was making, the one you were referencing, was you've actually got to deliver it in a style. So not the content in itself, but in it, the, the style of the content or the delivery of the content has also got to be tailored to the way your audience are. If you were delivering a presentation to a bunch of HR executives, you would have to deliver it very, very differently to if you were delivering it to a bunch of CTOs, for example. Right. For sure. Okay, are we ready for the next protocol? Absolutely. Okay, the next protocol is practice. Um, and practice is a very, very, very important thing. You'll remember the FBI's six Ps. Perfect practice um, prevents particularly poor performance <laughs> or, or something along those lines <laughs> you may you may have that was my cleaned up version of it you may have heard a different version <laughs> um practicing is incredibly important and practice here's what practicing is not practicing is not looking at the powerpoint slides and in your head thinking yeah i'll say that while that slide is up <laughs> and i'll say this while this slide is up practicing should really be done out loud to a real-life audience, if possible. If you haven't got a real-life audience to do a practice run or two, do it to your voice recorder on your mobile phone or maybe even video record it on your mobile phone. But the more practicing you can do, the more polished you're going to make that presentation. And if it's worth presenting in the first place, it's worth presenting it in a practice run to get it right. Uh, as Zig Ziglar said, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly <laughs> until you can do it well. So, you know... Put yourself through a few cycles of practice so that you can make that presentation perfect. Uh, another phrase to remember is that amateurs practice until they get it right, but professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. <laughs> I should like to say that in advance of, uh, I gave a presentation a little over a year ago at IT Expo. It's the first time I've done that in a long time. And um, <clears throat> my boss was a little not surprised, but but I spent about three days where I took a half a day each day, and I gave the presentation, you know, in, in front of a little camera and looked back at myself. And I basically I was revising it and tweaking and revising and tweaking until until it was kind of not committed to memory, but I was familiar enough with not only the material but also the way I wanted to present it that if somebody asked me a question, they didn't throw me off my game. Excellent, Michael. Yeah, that, that's that's a very good good thing that you did because when you present it out loud whether it's to an audience or to a video camera or even just to an audio recorder you're going to come across things that don't sound right or phrases or things that you stumble over um and and you don't realize that until you actually do it out loud and, and, so, joke, yeah, and jokes that don't work that's a that's a big one jokes that don't work in the context of the presentation they might be funny to you in isolation but but yeah, yeah it's very much so and, of course, the other thing is that your nerves are probably going to be racing a little bit more at the beginning of the presentation. Then they'll kind of set, settle down as you get into it. And so practicing the first few minutes of the presentation until you can pretty much um, – I was just waving to somebody outside. I'm looking out the window. <laughs> um, practicing your presentation at the beginning of it until you can virtually do that kind of on autopilot – is a distinct advantage because when you know when when the tension is high and your nerves are high and you've just come out on stage or in front of the group or whatever if you can just launch into your presentation because you've practiced it um so many times then that will really do you a good service and also of equal importance i would say is the end of a presentation because you've probably seen a lot of presentations where and i'm sure uh, we'll see some in the future as well that kind of fizzle out they kind of whimper out at the end you know, they say, well, you know, that, that's all I've got to say, really. Uh, any questions? And then uh, control is handed over to the audience for the questions. And what happens is, you know, maybe there's one or two. Of course, it, it could be the embarrassing no questions. Or <laughs> it, it could be that there's a couple of questions and then it kind of dies out. Um, and, and it, you know, fizzles out and loses the will to live. 
And um, I, I'm a big fan of actually the presenter keeping hold of the presentation and saying something like this. Okay, before I summarise my main points, who's got my first question? So then you temporarily give control to the audience to ask questions. And when they finished asking questions, you know that control is coming back to you, the presenter. And now you're going to summarise your main points. You're going to send everybody off on a high and uh, solicit an amazing round of applause. And that's much, much better than letting it kind of whimper out near the end. <laughs> David, you mentioned that you needed to get going soon. So let's make sure that we have the URLs that people need to consult to check out your upcoming uh, publication. Thank you very much, Randy. Yeah, I'll just mention the last couple of protocols while we're here. One of them, I'm struggling with the name for this one. But it's going to be begin with a P, and it's either the presentation itself, the actual delivery, you know, your pitch, your posture, your pace of your speech and things like that. And uh, it's either it's either production or presentation. I haven't decided. Uh, I'm, I'm open to comment on that. And then the last one is post-event. It's what you do after the presentation to ensure that it has been a success. So, so those are the protocols there. If people would like to see more and download the same paper that Michael kindly did, uh, they can go to letthegeekspeak.com slash free dash report. That's letthegeekspeak.com slash free dash report. And there they can sign up, get the uh, free download, and uh, I will let them know when the book comes out. And I'm also planning to be delivering training on this uh, through kind of seminars and, and, and maybe even more in-depth workshops as well. Because the, the whole reason for this is I'm so sad that I see so many clever people out there who are not rewarded to the level they should be given their technical skills. And I want to help people communicate better so they can kind of be more successful in life. I want geeks not only to speak, I want them to be properly rewarded and recognized as well. David, thank you so much for uh, for uh, for coming. Obviously, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say for putting up with uh, <laughs> what's happening here. We don't have any visual, but we do have the audio, and it's great. And I have that letthegeekspeak.com up on the screen now, and that's about all we can do. And we're right, probably okay. what, one thing I would just say is if people go to justletthegeekspeak.com, they'll find kind of a holding front page. Uh, they, they, they need to click on the free report thing down right. at the bottom and that will take them to the right page right and they can contact you at all the usual places and by the way you'll be at as you said you'll be at kama ilio world let's pronounce that properly folks kama ilio world yes sir. uh <laughs> uh and that's in a couple of weeks i'm really looking forward to seeing you maybe our last time david you never know because i'm old I, I hope so, not, Randy. I hope there'll be many more. But yeah, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time. Right. And there's several of us are going to be there, and we'll see you then. And uh, from then on, are we forgetting anything? David, I know you have to go, but has anybody else got any business we need to get out there before we cut yeah, off this yeah, hangout? Yeah, I'm, 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 all right. I'm all right for a few minutes, Randy. So oh, Okay. Well, so you're going to be at so you're going to be at ComCon in the United Kingdom? Yeah, do, doing them in order quick. It's Open Sip Summit next week. Come which is which is where open sips is where I'm at, um, that's in amsterdam amsterdam right and because it won't only be the open sips people there but people like lorenzo from the homer project will also be there and uh alex goulis uh, an open sips stalwart he'll be there and um, then the following week is as you know 6th to the 8th of may in berlin for daniel's Kama ilio world looking forward to that greatly um the first week or the second week of july is comcon very much looking forward to that. And I, I tweeted some pictures of the venue for that because uh, since I'm helping out, um, Dan invited me along for a little bit of a recce of the venue. And we went and had a look around that earlier this week. Um, in fact, I say earlier this week, it was yesterday. So <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> um, and uh, then there's also um, ClueCon, 5th to the 9th of August in Chicago with Tony and the rest of the Free Switch team. Very much looking forward to that. And Astricon, of course, has been announced not by me this year, but by uh, Sangoma. And that's on the 29th and 30th of October in Atlanta, I believe. Okay. I don't have a slide for Astrocon, but we have the ClueCon slide up. And um, gosh, you know, everybody should go to all these things, but I can only go to one, and that's Camellia World from the 6th to the 8th of May. So we'll look forward to that. Anything else, David? Um, Tell us, speak. Did we get into that much? 
Uh, we, we didn't really. That's my consulting company, and we still do asterisk training. In fact, actually, I do have an upcoming class I can tell people about. Yeah. If they want to come and uh, turbocharge their asterisk knowledge and experience, they can come on a, an intensive four-and-a-half-day class we call the asterisk advanced class, and we're running it at the Sangoma UKHQ uh, this coming May, so next month. Um, it's the 20th to the 24th, and it's very limited seats because it's in their boardroom. I think we're down to eight seats and we've already got a few takers. Um, but you can get details of that by going to telespeak.co.uk slash calendar. Or you can find details on the Digium website. But that's the Asterisk Advanced class. That's uh, a week's worth of Asterisk fun. And da David, you've been doing this for something like 20 years, right? Um, I've, I've been teaching telecoms uh, for 20 odd years, but I've been teaching Asterisk since about 2006. So 13 years. Only 13 years. Okay. Sounds like it's good enough. We're going to end this hangout because it really sucks, basically. I mean, as far as the video goes, it's really stupid that we can't see anything but the slide that I finally put up and typed up. But, um, David, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to partying with you. We'll have a good time. We'll see a bunch of people. And hopefully you'll, by the way, you'll take part in the VUC Visions thing, which is going to be about AR and VR and... Uh, Lots of interesting people who you all know will be a part of that. So Yeah, I'd be happy to come back on. I do I do keep up with you. I don't always watch live. I've watched on YouTube. Uh, but I generally keep up with what's going on. I'd be happy to come back again. And uh, I noticed there's no Bodhi today. Is, is that a, I, he, yeah, I don't know. He was. I would have expected that he would be attracted by your name. But for some reason, the branding didn't uh, come through. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Bodhi's been very, very busy recently. So Great. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, right. you will see him then. You'll see us, and we'll we'll all get together, and we'll have a good time. And there's going to be great things happening there, and also at ComCon. I don't think I'll be there, but and the ClueCon and AstroCon, of course. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, David. Thank Talk you. to you Bye. soon. Have time with you all. All the best. All right. See Bye -bye. you soon. Bye-bye.